Does that make sense? So if I assess the head, and if there's something wrong with the head, I will get a finding from the proctors. If I don't assess properly, they will not give you a finding, thus you will have failed. So if you kind of skirt over and you go to, from the head to the abdomen and don't um, assess the chest, if there's something wrong with the chest, you didn't assess it, therefore you're not going to get a finding, therefore you didn't do the skill properly. So you cannot find a finding. You have to assess for a finding. Okay? I know that doesn't make much sense right now, but there are nine things wrong with this patient. Nine. Two of them you're not going to be able to do anything about because two of them have nothing wrong with them. But you need to assess to get that finding. Is that making sense? Okay. So you can't get something if you don't look for it, in other words. Okay. So you guys might not, I'll do it on one side over here so you guys can see what a male, then I'll go on this side. Where's, who's the other gal? Who's the other person? Just right there. What? Okay, so, so then I'll flip on this side and then you guys can see head to toe. Alright, so we'll leave your hat on, but normally you would take the hat off. Okay, so you have your hands. When you palpate, let me just use your arm for a second, just to keep your arm straight up for a second. If you're going to palpate, don't, don't do this. You may as well just go ahead and massage, get your 25 bucks and roll them over. Palpate, not to do any damage, but you need to find out if there's something wrong. So when you're palpating in the chest region or in the leg region, don't do this. Don't. You're here for a reason to find out if there's anything else wrong with the patient. You have a lot of shit in there. <laughs> okay? You have to palpate as if you were actually trying to discover any latent injury. Now, the person's unresponsive. They may not complain of anything because they're unresponsive, but even if they were responsive, they may not complain of something that isn't that they're not aware of. They could have internal bleeding, but in this position, they can't feel any pain. But as soon as you sit them up, oh my God. So palpate and do this properly and make sure that you're actually palpating to look for something. Try not to look to break anything either. Like, if you don't find anything, don't like, you don't, you don't just palpate and move on, okay? So we're gonna start with the head. Spread your fingers apart and you're gonna palpate from the, what is this, low? Frontal. Frontal all the way to the Simple. occipital. Okay, you need to know the landmarks, because if there's an indentation zygomatic, where do I point to? Right here, okay, the, uh, the, the foamen. Parietal. Okay, you need to know the hemispheres, okay, we'll do this later. Palpate, go from the frontal, occipital, all the way back. Then you're going to fill the C-spine. How many C's in the C-spine? Seven. Seven. Look at your hands for any blood. Then you're going to look in the ears. You're not going to move his head. You're going to look in the ears and the nose for any cerebral spinal fluid or blood. You're going to open the mouth. You're looking for good oral hydration or any possible obstructions. You're going to check the eyes to see if they're reacting. Once the entire head region is done, if there is something wrong, the proctor will let you know. So. The next anatomical region would be what? The neck. the neck. So I'm looking for jugular vein distension or tracheal deviation. What is jugular vein distension? The neck. The bulging? Okay. Should he have full neck veins lying down? Yes or no? No. He should. Yes, he should. If he's standing up, should he have flat neck veins? Yes. Now, there's a difference between full and bulging. Full, when he's lying down, I can feel it's kind of spongy. Bulging is going to be very prominent. What would that indicate? This is a physiological question. What would that indicate? If he's lying supine, and, or? Okay, it's, it's, it's more than likely an obstruction of the um, circulatory system that's backed up. Some kind of traumatic injury is causing the neck veins to be full and bulging. That is jugular vein <coughs> distension. Distension means to be filled. That's what I'm looking for. You're not palpating the neck, you're just looking for it. Also, you're gonna look for uh, tracheal deviation, which is what? Pneumothorax. Okay, caused by what? Pneumothorax. The collapse of hemothorax or a pneumothorax. So you have some pressure on both sides of the lungs. One of the lungs is collapsed either by trauma, either the air is being deflated or it's filling up with blood, causing it to deviate or to fill up. The trachea will deviate to the good side. That's all I'm observing. Okay? The proctor will let you know if there's anything wrong. Then, when we get to the chest, 
and to the abdomen, you will need to say for both regions without unnecessary exposure to the patient's chest, I'm going to look for bruising, areas of flail, or scarring. Bruising is what? Contusions, trauma, okay? What if it wasn't a car accident? What if you took the patient's uh, shirt off and there's bruising? What would that indicate? Well, what if it's not what if it's not a traumatic injury to a car accident? What if there are stages of bruising? Okay, what is blue? Is that fresh or old? Old. Blue? Fresh. Fresh. I would think he just got his head popped. Then you got brown, which is in degrees of healing, and then you have yellow, which is pretty much, you know, either they're just jaundiced or they're getting better. Okay. But on a on a chest or an abdominal region, you might want to consider what? On children? Abuse. 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 Yes, or it could be on a male that just you know, can't fight back on us. <laughs> All right. So anyway, when you get to the chest region, without unnecessary exposure to the patient's chest, I'm looking for bruising, areas of flail or scarring. What is flail? Two or more ribs broken on the side. Oh, okay. All right. We're going to go with it. It's a three, two, one. Three more ribs broken in two or more places on the same side. Very close, though. So you got three or more ribs on one side of the body broken in two or more places, which would cause paradoxal motion. So when he breathed out, this part of the chest would go up, and if the flail is on this side, this side would indent. It's called paradoxal motion. Okay, that's what flail is. Then scarring, scarring is stuck. How you do this? You look for the chest, you feel the integrity of the sternum, and you feel for the equal rise and fall of the chest. Then you take your stethoscope and you listen to all four fields. You don't need to get a rate, just make sure that you're actually doing it like this from side to side. Okay. Now, without unnecessary, if there's anything wrong with the chest, the proctor will tell you at that point. Now, going to the abdomen. Again, without unnecessary exposure to the patient's abdomen, I'm looking for lacerations, penetrations, or eviscerations. Lacerations are slices, active cuts. Okay? Penetrations are some kind of impalement. Uh, maybe part of the drive shaft, a uh, stick, a bat, whatever. What is an evisceration? What's an evisceration? Wait, wait, look up, look up, look up your phone. What? Yeah. what? Are you looking it up? What's an evisceration? Like intestines going out. Okay, intestines where? Out. out. Generally, it's intestines, but it's any organ on the outside of the body cavity. It's an evisceration. Generally, because the intestines take up the mass of the uh, torso, that's going to be the first thing you're going to see. You're not going to generally see uh, intestines and then the spleen. Okay, you're not going to see a kidney pop up unless it's really, really good trauma. But generally speaking, yes, intestines on the outside of the body, how do you treat it? David, how would you treat it? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Daniel. Uh, moist David packaging? Uh, how do you, what, how do you oh, yeah. saline? You just put it back in packaging because you can't. You can't put it back in. Yeah. Okay. Laura, what do you think? Sterile wet no, dressing? No, you, you, you come up with something. You got, you got his internal organs outside of his body. How do you, how do you package it? Cover it with sterile dressing. Okay, sterile dressing, yes, but sterile what kind of sterile? Dressing? Moist. Yeah, you want to keep it moist because you put a sterile dressing on it, that's great. That's fine. But you're going to have the nutrients of the um, intestines absorb into the, that uh, dry material. You want to get a saline or an IV bag, cut it up and douse the sterile 4x4 four four or the trauma dressing and just put it over there and soak it and then transport it. What you're wanting to do is close up as much as you can so what doesn't get in? An infection. Okay. So that's eviscerations. Okay. Lacerations, penetrations, eviscerations. You look for that. You palpate all four quadrants in a rolling motion. You divide the umbilicus. Here's the umbilicus, quadrant one, two, three, and four. All you're doing is rolling. The proctor will tell you what you discover if there is anything wrong. Penetration. penetration, if it is, depending on what it is. What, is it a penetration upward? It depends. This is where you need to learn the thoracic region. What organs could possibly be um, injured? If the uh, trajectory of a pole is going up this way, I would expect a lot of the intestines possibly perforated on the lungs and maybe something into, uh, not the spleen, but uh, one of the kidneys if it's going downward. So you need to know um, when Mike gets into trajectory of an injury, um, 
what you need to be aware of in that quadrant area. Okay? Um, with a penetration, do not remove it. If it doesn't fit, you can cut a portion of the external piece off. It's very dangerous though, because why? Because you're, yeah, unless you just have a saw ready to cut it off, this can start to vibrate that once it's in there and starts to vibrate, it could splinter depending on what kind of material it is. You can move it around that, you know, it was, it was a couple centimeters away from the heart, now it's actually vibrating and now it's severing the aorta. Now you just cause more problems. So if you can, leave it as is, leave it as is. Pack it with ice, with sterile dressing if you can, reduce the swelling, continue to maintain the airway, and get out of it. Okay? Um, but, okay, so lacerations, penetrations, and discerations, that's what you're looking for. You palpate all four quadrants. The next region is the iliac crest. What is that? Another word for pelvis. 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 Okay. Without even, um, let me, oh, you're not, can you come over here for just a second? Without touching him, point to where the iliac crest is. Where do you think it is? A little bit more this way, right? So that hard part? Yeah, hard. Uh, yeah. So that is what you're going to do, okay? So without even like pulling everything off and looking for it, you need to know exactly where it is you're going to push down and together. You're not going to push down and together like two motions. It's down and together. You're rocking the pelvis to check for the stability of the pelvis. Crepitus? Uh, crepitus is one thing that you're looking for, but you just want to make sure that the pelvis is stable due to any kind of... Um, dislocation, any possible injury to the femoral artery. That's why if there's an indication that this is compromised, there's a good chance that this is going to be compromised, the femoral artery, okay, because that's high impact. So you check the pelvis for stability, you move to the next region. On a male, we're looking for a priapism. Try not to put the R in there. It's a priapism, not a prism. Priapism is a neurological accident that causes the male genitalia to become erect. I assure you, there is no sexual gratification whatsoever, okay? People have had this on injuries. It is a painful stimulus. It may look attractive to some people, but it is very painful because it is pulling on the nervous system up. Does that mean they're paralyzed? No, it doesn't necessarily mean they're paralyzed. It means that it's a spinal injury that possibly could get him paralyzed, but it's not something that, you know, we play ring toss with. It's just, it's unfortunate. Okay, <laughs> so on a female, what are we looking for? We are looking for vaginal discharge in excess of 1,000 cc's. So if you don't know what 1,000 cc's are, if you have access to an IV bag, have someone put some kind of color or Kool-Aid in there, drop it onto a uh, white towel or blanket, and you can see what 1,000 cc's looks like. If it has a bloody discharge of that amount or more, you can conclude there might be some internal bleeding. The patient could have been possibly pregnant, but that miscarriage would not flow out like that. There's more than likely some kind of internal bleeding. But something to be aware of, okay? Then on the lower extremities, what are the acronyms? DCAP VTLS. So we got deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, or penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, or swelling. You can do one leg and then go over to the other leg and palpate it. I don't care how you do it, just as long as you palpate both extremities all the way down looking for DCAP VTLS. Then you'll need to at least get some kind of pedal pulse. You can get a dorsal pulse if you're that acute to it. Get a pedal pulse, or at least look like you're getting a pedal pulse. See if you can get any kind of motion. Say at this point I would do my CSSTP. Patient's unresponsive, you may not get it, but just mention it. Go to the upper extremities. Palpate all the way down again. Try to get bilateral pulses. You're not going to get a CMSTP with your fingers because the patient's unresponsive. Okay? So now what's the last region I need to focus on? Back. The back. This is a log rolling technique. I'm not actually going to log roll them, but you're going to need to know the technique. Depending on what side you're on, you take the hand closest to you and put it above his head. You take the leg farthest away from you and pull it over his leg. You position yourself between his shoulder and his hip. You take this arm and slide it right here. Maintaining C-spine precautions. You have to say this. While maintaining C-spine precautions, I'm going to log roll my patient towards me on the count of three. One, two, three, I'm gonna pull him towards me. I'm gonna leave my hand on his shoulder. I'm gonna take my other hand and go down the buttocks to check for any pooling, go up the spine, check for decap VTLS or any muscle spasms or splinting. Put my hand back on his uh, hip on the count of three again. We're gonna log roll him back. One, two, three, and he's down. After this point, then you go into your vitals. So that's head to toe, okay? 
Let's just do it one more time. And this time we'll explain everything. So, you spread your fingers apart and you palpate from the frontal region, parietal to the occipital. You let check your hands for blood. Why am I checking for blood? Because I have blood on the spinal cord in the back. That's not a good sign, but you need to actually look at it. Why am I looking in the ears and the nose for cerebral spinal fluid or blood? It, it's, it is internal bleeding, but want to be more specific. I guess if I can treat, yes. <laughs> what, what, what would you think would cause cerebral spinal fluid to come out of his ears and nose? Swelling of the brain. What is it called? Cerebral edema. Okay, now you're talking to feet. Okay, ICP, <laughs> intracranial pressure. Cerebral, yes, it, it, it is swelling. Yes, it is. I'll give you that one. But you have to start now terminally terminizing your, your, your language to match an EMT. Okay, so... Then you're looking in the mouth. Why, are you, why do I want to have oral hydration, good oral hydration? Especially if this person was ejected outside. I don't know how many people get ejected inside, unless you have a really bad marriage. Why would the person have... This is on tape. We're looking for oral hydration. <laughs> it's obvious that we're looking for um, any obstructions or potential uh, dentures or something that could choke them. But why do I care about well, good oral hydration? What would that indicate? Anyone? Let's try this table. So I open his mouth and he has good oral hydration. Or I open his mouth and he doesn't. Okay, it's an airway issue. Cool. Yes. It will give you an indication, a reasonable indication, if it's bad or poor oral hydration, the patient has been here for a while. The person has dehydrated. Now, if you were to keep your mouth open for five minutes, you couldn't do it. I, I doubt if you could do it. You'd have to like go. <laughs> if a person does not have the ability to salivate his own mouth, he's been unresponsive for a while. Keep that in mind. Good oral hydration would indicate reason. It's, it's one tool to determine how long the patient could have been on, um, you know, on scene. So we're looking for good oral hydration or any obstructions that would include the airway. Then I'm going to check the um, eyes for reactivity. I want to see if the pupils from a, a dormant state either contract or dilate. That's all I want to know. If one is blown, what does that tell you? What does blown mean, first of all? Is it big or small? It can be big or small, basically it's fixed. It has no reaction. That's blown. Now, yes, they have bigger ones that are blown, but that would that could indicate a stroke as well, but we know that this person hit a tree. We're going to assume that it is a blown pupil due to bone, head trauma, on that same side. Okay? That explains the head. That's the M-E-E-N. Mouth, ears, eyes, nose. Got that? Okay. When we go into the neck, I'm looking for jugular vein distension or tracheal deviation. I will note whether I see it or not. I'll tell the proctor, this is what I'm looking for. The proctor will let you know if there's anything wrong. You don't do anything else. Okay, we... How do you see tracheal deviation? How do you see it? Like tracheal deviation is a latent sign, meaning that it's something usually if the person has tracheal deviation, it's within... 45 minutes to an hour on scene. The patient doesn't immediately collapse the lung and it drops. Um, I, for one, had a collapsed lung when I was in high school. Um, fortunately, I was at work, so I had workers' comp for it. But my tracer didn't deviate um, right away. It didn't deviate at all because they inflated the lung. Um, it's a latent sign. It's, it, it will determine length of time. Um, it doesn't show up right away. Jugular vein distension, however, is either due to some kind of blockage or hemorrhage, which is flooding up the uh, neck vein. Okay, so we're looking for that. Then we're going to assess the chest. Without unnecessary exposure to the patient's chest, I'm looking for bruising, areas of flow, or scarring. We know what bruising is, and the stages that will be kind of determined if it is a child issue. Scarring, we know what scarring is. And then flail, three, two, one. Three more ribs broken in two more places on the same side. If you get flail, I'll show you how to treat that. Without any unnecessary exposure to the patient's abdomen, I'm looking for lacerations, oh sorry, listen for lung sounds in all four fields. Without any unnecessary exposure to the patient's abdomen, I'm looking for lacerations, penetrations, and eviscerations. Then I'm going to palpate all four quadrants. If there's something wrong, the proctor will tell you. Then I'm going to palpate the iliac crest, push down and together, check the genitalia. Whether or not you have a male or female, you will have to say both. On a male, I'm looking for a priapism. On a female, I'm looking for bloody discharge in excess of 1,000 cc's. The proctor will note if anything is needed to be done. Then I'm going to palpate the lower extremities using DCAP BTLS. Okay, I'm going to get a bilateral pedal pulse. 
Since my patient is unresponsive, I'm not going to be able to do CMSTP, so we're going to move on to the upper extremities. Again, I'm going to use DCAT DTLS, and I'm going to palpate uh, bilateral pulses. I'm not going to be able to do uh, CMS because the patient's unresponsive. <coughs> Okay, then I'm going to log roll my patient, take the arm closest to me and put it above his head, the leg farthest away from me, over the cross, position myself in between his shoulder and his uh, pelvis. On the head's count, on the count of three, we're going to log roll my patient towards me. One, two, three. Leaving my right hand on his shoulder, I'm going to take my other hand, palpate the buttocks for any pulling. What is pulling? Pulling. Uh, pulling? Anyone? Internal bleeding. Okay, kind of, yeah. Pulling would indicate that the person or has been, been normal for time. quite a long time and the body's cavity, the blood will pull into one of the lowest areas, which is more than likely going to be the butt. Okay? It would be somewhat like lividity, it would be like poor lividity because of the yeah. But, <laughs> so yeah, pulling is not a good sign. It feels like Rice Krispies underwater. Anyone ever do that? Then you're also going up the spine, you're checking the thumb, the lumbar and thoracic area for any muscle splinting or muscle spasms. You'll see that it's a neurological area. Then you want to log roll the patient back on the count of three, one, two, three, roll back. Okay. And, and it's clear to do the log roll on the side of the 